enterprise session. Um, there's lots of OpenStack to the enterprise sounding session. So this is the Dell and Red Hat one. Hopefully you're in the, the right one. Um, let me get it kicked off right now. So um, I'm Steve Croce. I work for Dell. That long title basically just means I own uh, you know, our, our OpenStack roadmap, what products we bring to market with OpenStack, how we, how we productize it, and how we sell and, and work with the OpenStack uh, community. Uh, presenting the kind of second half of this is uh, Sean Cohen, uh, my counterpart on the Red Hat side, product manager, principal, uh, principal product manager for OpenStack. So what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, first of all, you know, just look at how you know, discussions about uh, enterprise and OpenStack and, and mentions of enterprise have, have changed over time. Um, who are these guys? How do we define it uh, between us and Red Hat? You know, who, 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 who is an enterprise customer? What kind of things do they run? A uh, real short intro there. Um, and then why is this kind of a good thing for the community? So you know, short intro on just you know, what we're doing, who these folks are, why, you know, why we're working in this space, and then really start to dig into you know, how we work together, uh, Dell and Red Hat, you know, what things we, we think are important and some of the lessons we've learned, things that, we, you know, hopefully you can leverage and learn from yourselves. Um, and then where we're going next, the things that we're starting to develop on now, the, the, the areas where we're going to work on upstreaming, and then some takeaways. So, you know, just drew a little chart of, you know, kind of the, you know, uh, OpenStack getting more and more enterprisey over time. So looking way back at the beginning, you know, Austin Diablo, you know, it was kind of a, you know, no, very few enterprise mentions, not really big focus at the time. It was kind of a, you know, don't even think about it type of space. You know, it's not ready. Uh, but once we hit, you know, Essex and, 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 you know, through Folsom, it got into what, you know, pretty much I'd call like a gathering requirements phase. So people started talking about, okay, what would an enterprise need, you know, you know, how can the enterprise benefit from this technology? And so it started to come together, and it was a little bit more of, well, it's getting there. It's almost there. And, and you know, but still, you know, you still had the, you know, standard, you know, standard uh, OpenStack Summit dress code. You had t-shirts and jeans in, in a lot of the presentations. But then, you know, things started to get, you know, a lot more corporate entities coming in. So the golf shirts came in uh, grizzly through Ice House. And the talk was then, you know, how can vendor X, you know, enable the enterprise, right? So a lot of vendors started coming in and saying, well, here's what we're doing to make this, make this technology, make OpenStack more palatable to the enterprise. Here are the, you know, here are the areas where you can benefit. And that's where it was like, it's, you know, it's almost ready. It's almost there. We started to see some, you know, adopters in the enterprise start to, start to pick up and run with this thing and some really good early examples of how to use OpenStack in the enterprise. Um, and now, you know, we hit Juno and, you know, it's, 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 we're starting to actually hear, here's how Enterprise X has benefited from OpenStack. We're seeing more and more talks about, you know, success stories or at least stories of people, you know, using it, having some best, you know, coming out with some best practices, coming out with some, some of their learnings. And really we're finding the core is ready. Now there's still some, you know, other products on the, you know, projects on the, on the peripheral, uh, periphery that, you know, need potentially a little bit more work and may not be enterprise ready, but really the core is ready. And, um, you know, given I work on the, on the product management side, I look to, you know, Gartner every now and again, and they made a statement recently that Juno is OpenStack 1.0 for the enterprise, which I kind of like that statement. I think it, it kind of makes sense, and it's kind of directionally correct, that right around Juno, things started to get, you know, kind of stable enough that it was a real, you know, 1.0 kind of product for the enterprise. And so people could start using it, people could really start going and get some good reps on it, and you know, take it from there, but it's still you know, 1.0 gets a part that you know, get, gets, gets to the point of view that there's still some, you know, uh, you know, still some places to go with this. And so you know, I talk about enterprise and like, who are these guys, right? Who, you know, who's this enterprise that we talk about? And it's like, you know, if I look at the you know, Dell general picture asset catalog, you know, these are the guys that kind of come up and you know, no, that's, that's, that's not it. So how do we characterize you know, enterprise IT and the, the folks that we're looking to address and the folks we're looking to help with our solutions? And so you know, first of all, there's no one definition. It's not if you do this, you're an enterprise. If you don't do this, you're enterprise IT. It's, it's not that clear cut. So it's kind of you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a loose definition. And it's more around how uh, folks are using IT, the types of things they're trying to manage and run. And also, you know, 
Fortune 500 doesn't equal enterprise. So just because you're a big company, that's not you know enterprise IT. Very large companies operate their IT in very very advanced ways that don't have you know some of the traditional challenges we think of when we you know when we talk about enterprise IT. So there's really no you know hard and fast definition there, at least in our words when we say we're making an enterprise grade OpenStack um, solution. So what are they running? Well, we start to see, and this is one of the areas where it really starts to get a little bit clear, we see a larger responsibility to support legacy and proprietary, right? So there's, you know, you've got some old applications that have been running for a very, very long time, may not, you know, have an opportunity or really the ability to, you know, upgrade those or, or you know, use something that's newer or that's something that's, you know, potentially scaled out. You still have some scale up types of, uh, of workloads. You've also got some proprietary things, either legacy proprietary things or just new style proprietary things. There's a lot of enterprise virtualization and the features that go along with it. So um, you know, th these are the types of things to comprehend. Um, the other thing is there are bound to be pets. So you have this pets and cattle conversation. There are going to be some pets there. Now, the question is, and you know, it's, there's lots of ways to, to, to go with the conversation, is well, which of these things should be in OpenStack? Which of these things shouldn't be in OpenStack? Should you control them from OpenStack? Should you keep them separate? That's you know, a completely separate conversation, but it's the type of conversation that you have in this space. And so, you know, what do they do? Well, there's, you know, you've got a whole organization to support. You've got multiple business units, and really, you're turning it, you know, turning into a service provider for all these different business units. So, there's, you know, people are running their business, and ultimately, you are the, you know, you are the provider that for that. And by the way, you usually have some finite resources. We see a lot more resource constraints in this space, and therefore, a lot more of an openness to leverage, you know. Uh, vendor support and support resources. So that's not, not, that's not to say this is everybody, but ultimately the challenge of you know, running mission critical, supporting the business with a you know, very tight budget and the pressure to expand and to support more and more, uh, you know, more and more technologies from different LOBs with the same budget or the same folks, that's kind of the challenge we see. And so there's you know, reliance on vendor support, but now kind of a push to, to um, you know, try and do things a different way. And so, what has the community done so far? And, and you know, breezing through slightly quickly in the first pa half of this, because this is really just you know, a little bit of history, a little bit of you know, storytelling on, on where we are today. Um, and so the first piece of it is just the expansion of the D Design Summit. You know, anybody who's been through the last, uh, uh, through the last summits, you, know, you look at the pretty much number of people here is doubling every year. So that's more people getting involved, more people getting interested, more and more talks, as I showed in a couple slides ago, on enterprise and how to use these things. Um, there are working groups specifically dedicated to this group. There's an enterprise, you know, win the enterprise working group, which met once earlier today. They're going to meet throughout the week. There's also, I just left before this, the product manager working group, which is how do we add, you know, uh, how do we try and add, you know, some product management rigor to OpenStack without killing the, you know, the agility and the, and, and the, the uh, way in which OpenStack's been able to grow as quickly as it has. Um, more drivers, more hardware, more devices. So that proprietary and legacy stuff I talked about in the previous slides, we're getting more and more support so that the, the, you know, the, 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 the question is no longer, well, go buy a whole bunch of new stuff to run OpenStack on it. You can run it on the stuff you've already got, especially in the enterprise. That's something, you know, for example, that we, you know, we hit on the Dell side. We have you know, Equalogic, which is one of our enterprise storage, you know, storage products. We support that, code's upstream. So hey, if you have that and you want to tie it into OpenStack, that's cool. Don't worry about having to rip and replace everything. Um, and that's happening throughout. Almost every vendor's come in to make sure when you enter the data center, almost every technology that's already in there, yeah, yeah, we, that, that'll work with OpenStack. Um, the feature set. So adding things, in some cases, that are actually a little bit contrary to the, you know, kind of the original goal, the original um, you know, uh, direction of OpenStack, like Tenant, you know, tenant HA and VMHA, which Sean's going to talk about in a little bit. These are things that people are working on to bring into OpenStack to be able to support, you know, just a little bit of an easy, a lower hurdle to get, you know, the enterprise users working on OpenStack and using it. You know, if it, take advantage of the operational model without necessarily having to change your entire application model. And then there's also commercial distributions for, with support. Once again, running mission critical you know, applications with a finite group of, of engineers, well, you've got companies, for example, Red Hat behind you to be able to you know, kind of fill the gap should anything go wrong. OK, so now I'm going to dig into, you know, given this definition and, and, and this enterprise group that you know, we're trying to make you know, OpenStack enterprise grade for, 
Let's, I want to talk about what Dell and Red Hat have been doing together. Um, you know, both of us have been involved in OpenStack for, for quite a while, but it was a little over a year ago, it was about a year and a half ago, uh, the two of us came together to really start working on integrated solutions to kind of address this space. And so, you know, uh, the, kind of the example that came to mind is, I, you know, I've got my Karate Kid example there, because really the w things we've been focusing on the past, you know, year and a half is really, you know, doing the quote unquote, the boring things that matter most. And, you know, the, the, the real foundational core, you know, repetitive things that OpenStack needs to just be stable and, 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 and able to, you know, run, get closer to production and mission critical workloads right out of the gate without having to stub your toe a bunch of times to get there. So that's, you know, getting the core functionality right. And I'll talk about some details there in the coming slides. Making OpenStack repeatable. You know, if we cannot repeat what we've done in our lab at the, you know, at the customer site or in your data center, we can't support it. It's a nightmare if we can't see the same thing you're seeing. So trying to find ways to make OpenStack repeatable so that not only between our data center and your data center, but between your data center and your other data center, you're able to get some consistency out of OpenStack. Making OpenStack testable. So there's you know, a number of different ways to get from you know, bare metal to a deployed OpenStack cloud. How do we test and make sure that things are, you know, just because it's up and running, doesn't mean everything's up and running the exact way that you thought it would be running. So working on making OpenStack testable. Best practices on configurations, um, and I'll talk about this, you know, this in some detail in a, in a slide or two, is that things get interesting when you put it on real hardware. Testing things in, you know, in, in, in a virtual environment or in a limited you know, CI infrastructure doesn't really ring out everything. So best practices, what we've learned on configurations. And then the fewer snowflakes you know, statement is not in any way any kind of statement around an appliance or trying to you know, really limit what you're able to run in OpenStack, but it's just being able to drive some consistency, being able to make sure that once again, when you deploy in one place and you deploy in another place, it's not going to change drastically from deployment to deployment so that you can expand easily, so you can connect easily, so that you can do all these things. And so, you know, really the statement at the bottom is OpenStack that just, uh, that just works and you don't need the, you know, Ninja or your, your Mr. Miyagi to, 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 to come fix it for you. So full stack validation on real hardware. This is one of the things we do. And I point to the things kind of we're doing. But I, you know, I, want, I, I don't want this to just be, hey, here's how we did it. Just, these are some examples of areas where we've, you know, we've had to do things because we've either run into bugs or issues or you know, things that, that need work on. So you're doing it yourself. These are things to think about. So one of the things we've done is we integrate the, you know, kind of the product or the configurations that we sell into the Red Hat CI. So every, every, everything that gets you know, uh, updated on the Red Hat side goes through our CI, which is the actual hardware that we sell in the actual, hardware, in the actual configuration we sell. Now, that's significant because you know, I had the, the note here, upstream doesn't test the full matrix. Upstream tests everything, and there's a CI that tests all the features, but it doesn't test every single feature with every single other feature. So every single you know, Cinder driver with every single hypervisor, with every single piece of hardware, with every single NIC, et cetera, et cetera. So we're testing the exact configurations that, you know, and, 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 and validation suite that we've got with the exact hardware it configured in the exact way that we uh, configure it. So, once again, ringing out those issues up front. You're going to see things as, as you get to real hardware. Tempest and Rally for validation. So there's a talk uh, tomorrow afternoon at, at 2.50 on, on this you know, very topic. And there's a couple, uh, couple more during the week. But we've been doing some, uh, some work with Tempest and Rally to build a validation suite within OpenStack. And that's another area where I mentioned earlier, just because you've got it up and running doesn't mean everything's running the exact way you expected it to. So building a real comprehensive test suite with Tempest and Rally. We do still have some tests outside of Tempest right now, but we're working to you know, get more and more of that functionality in. And today, it's just, a val it's just a deployment validator. Longer term goal is for it to be a continuous validator. So you run it on deployment, you continue to run it, and this is very much in line with you know, the DEF core work. We saw a big announcement on that today. Um, really getting it to that level where you can continue to run, continue to run Tempest, and get to the point where you've, uh, you know, you're, you're validating your, your cloud regularly. And then finally, HA and fault injection, another one of those areas where you know, 
testing the capability of, of dealing with a failure is different than being in a lab, pulling a cable, you know, having, having a hardware failure, pulling a node out of service, killing a service, you know, doing all those things on the real gear, on real hardware, is area where we've actually found failures. Things like, you know, even below OpenStack, Pacemaker, for example, we've run into Pacemaker issues as we, uh, you know, that have had to go, go and get fixed as we, as we really test all the failure modes in the HA system. So validating the full stack on real hardware is one of the areas that becomes really important. The other piece is you know, hardware selection and configuration. Now, that's not to say that this is anything that nobody in the world could go do, but once again, it's, it's the homework we've done up front to be able to provide you at least, you know, for someone looking to get, get started quickly, a good point of view on things known working in areas where we've seen problems and areas we haven't. So for hardware guidance, like, you know, there's, there's some things that just matter more in, uh, than, than others when we hit you know, incompatibilities and bugs and issues when we try to deploy. One area that we've you know, seen it happen a number of times is, is NICs. You know, NIC firmware, NIC vendors, all different types of things. We've had deployments where you go in and say, oh, let me just switch out the NICs because this is my, my vendor of choice. What could go wrong? It's, you know, things break, things don't come up correctly. So, you know, we, we provide guidance around, okay, we're, we, we standardize on NICs, but what server model it is, less important. You know, what, how, how, you, how you set up your storage, how you set up your RAID, maybe a little less important. How much memory, which processor you use, less important. So there's guidance around that. And I just have, you know, some little pictures of the docs that we provide, which once again is, you know, I talked about a little bit before an RA that's more than an RA. And we call what we do, what we create with Red Hat a reference architecture. But reference architectures are usually just, you know, sim is sort of a single configuration, you know, single way to set it up. And ours is a little bit more modular. We, we have with it deployment guides and all the tooling and scripting and everything that goes with it. So it's more of a flexible framework for how we're able to uh, deploy these things, or at least to give you a, a head start on how you can deploy them. Second piece is hardware configuration. There's a number of deployment tools out there. Not all of them configure RAID, configure BIOS, configure all the low-level things that you need to get started, once again, to drive some consistency throughout the cluster. Um, we have some tool set at Dell, uh, tool sets at Dell that we've created some automation around to make sure when we deploy this thing, it's consistent every time. But we're also pushing that support up into Ironic. So, uh, you know, for as things like Triple O, uh, you know, start to gain more traction, we'll have it in there. But also just for running bare metal instances, that support is is getting pushed up as well. And then finally, you know, just the the network configuration, not you know anything that's that's you know. Uh, rocket science here, but once again, having tested it, having run through and giving you a, a starting point and a template that's known to work and pretty much you know, focuses on balancing performance and scalability and resiliency and isolation. And it's not one of those, um, you know, like, you know, like you see in storage where you, you know, you've got three, three aspects you can pick two. We've really been able to balance all of these without having to sacrifice in any major way one over the other. So you know, we run. Uh, four 10 gig connections per node. We run dual 10 gig bonds. An example there gives you the resiliency. You've got failover. You've got high availability, but you've also got the throughput. You're not, you know, you're not having a a passive connection, and you're not wasting that extra connection. Um, we use VLAN type for neutron. We found that it's, you know, that's the, the that gives us the best, you know, kind of balance of performance and scalability. You know, once you get really big and you run out of VLANs, okay. If you've got a large number of tenants, you know, then we start to push into other things like VXLAN. But for 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 the, you know, for someone going into production and without a, you know, huge large number of, uh, of tenant networks, VLAN works quite well and it's actually pretty speedy. And then finally. Um, you know, the way we spread our services, we uh, have eight dedicated VLANs. Um, I could show the picture here. This is in our reference architecture, so uh, you, know, you can go to, uh, there's a link at the end of this to, to go pick it up. But ultimately, we've just architected it all out to balance across all those factors. It's scalable. It's easier to take these VLANs and pop them onto new NICs as you get bigger and bigger. Um, and once again, since we're aggregating on multiple connections, we get the bandwidth improvements, we get the redundancy improvements, but we also get the isolation of having everything v uh, VLAN uh, separated. And so, you know, didn't want to make a, a, a product pitch, so, but this is just a quick, you know, what we, how we sell this today. We, you know, for kind of getting rolling, we've got, you know, you can just get quoted immediately, a, a half rack to three racks. Beyond three racks, we usually like to talk to you because there are network considerations. There are a lot more considerations once you start to go big, but half rack to three racks, it's pretty standard architecture. Running the latest uh, Red Hat uh, OpenStack platform, 
latest Dell gear. We've recently just uh, moved to Neutron. We moved to Neutron a little bit later, but once again, it was another one of those scenarios where we didn't, you know, we stuck with Nova Network up until Juno. It wasn't until Juno that we really felt that that that, that Neutron was it was, you know stable enough and offered exact and, and uh, had HA capabilities and all the things we needed to be able to stick by our, our HA story and our enterprise grade story. So now we're on Neutron. Once again, fully active, active HA. The, the last component to make us fully active, active uh, came in Juno uh, with VRRP. So Sean will talk about that in a second. So now we're fully active, active. And then uh, one of the other areas that we spent uh, some resources in, in, in uh, you know, kind of up, upstreaming is around multi-storage concurrent. And what we mean there is having multiple sender backends at the same time. So given that our default storage in this is Ceph, the default storage backend is, is Ceph for, for our, our configuration, um, we still support Dell has Equalogic, which we've upstreamed the drivers for. We also have Dell's uh, compellent products, and, and, you know, which we've upstreamed the drivers for in Kilo and other vendors, uh, you know, enterprise storage. So once again, moving into an environment where you may have various different storage technologies, one of the areas we thought that would be very important is to be able to connect all those into OpenStack at once and not have to not ha uh, have them all, you know, be, have them be able to use with uh, QoS and other types of features. So at this point, I'm going to kick it over to Sean, who will kind of work up the stack a little bit more and talk about what we're doing next. Thank you, Steve. All right, so we talked about the integration with the hardware, and uh, Steve actually walked us uh, up to pretty much the software. <laughs> and this is where I want to zoom in and talk about uh, the work we've done in the core engineering and integration port. But before we start, I want to actually touch upon uh, the OpenStack side and the importance. And I would actually would start with uh, a question. How many of you uh, folks in the crowd drive cars? Raise your hand, all right, most of the crowd. How many uh, uh, car owners uh, are, your cars are operated actually by computers? Most of them, right? What happens if your computer, your car computer, goes not working, right? Like a failure, breaks, something. Who would you go to fix that brake failure which is computer related. Would you stop any, any shop on your way out uh, uh, from work? Or you would go to the manufacturer that actually knows the, the car computer to actually to fix it. And when we look at OpenStack, just to stand up OpenStack, you probably need something like nine services to talk to each other just so, so we have a consistent deployment. This is just OpenStack layer. But if we do dug deeper into OpenStack, OpenStack is pretty much a pluggable infrastructure that talks to other layers below to do the work. So if I'm going to create my volume in OpenStack, I'm going to act, OpenStack actually goes and asks Cleaver to do the dirty work and create the volume for me. And if we look down the stack, OpenStack has a very large dependency of the operating system it relies on top. And the reason I bring it up, in the last years, we have customer cases where we started up finding a, a, an issue. And when we dug, it's an OpenStack bug. It's an OpenStack case. We started to dug into to the layers. We found the problems in underlying layers, all the way to kernel. So if I have a kernel problem, right, as part of my cloud deployment, who would I go to? Uh, and Red Hat is being one of the leaders uh, uh, of OpenStack. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, code contribution, is, is not something that we see, yeah, we, we would like to stay as a top contributor. This is part of what we do. We need to stand behind the code in order to support it. And we support it for a few years uh, uh, right now. And the support actually goes, if you look at the stack, it's throughout the whole stack. So it starts with actually the guest OS that runs on top of OpenStack. Throughout the OpenStack itself, with all the different services and components, all the way to the operating system and the hypervisor. So in our case, it's KVM, which is the most common uh, hypervisor we see today in OpenStack implementations. But it doesn't end there, because we, as being uh, open, uh, working on providing RHEL, uh, we also have a very tight integration with the hardware community. So we are, ha have a lot, the largest uh, set of hardware vendors integrated and certified against. But this brings us to the table, if we work our bottom up, is whatever I plug into OpenStack, I have a quite at night that it's going to work because it's certified. We actually make sure that whenever you connect to uh, your RHEL, KVM, OpenStack, 
all the way up to the guest actually works in terms of hardware, right? So that's, that's something. Uh, but we also are able to impact on each one of these layers. And I think the strength of our, our distribution, just in, in a word, is the ability to actually do modifications. It's not just supporting and bugs and issues, but we actually be able to do performance enhancements, for example, at the hypervisor level uh, to benefit uh, the cloud infrastructure, for example. So we are able to do uh, impact at different layers of the stack to actually to, uh, bring more value. Um, so if we connect that, take, for example, uh, SE Linux. Uh, uh, which is the security, uh, military grade support, uh, uh, security that we have built into RHEL and is part of, of, of OpenStack. Uh, and we talk about enterprise, right? So if you're an enterprise customer, what are your security requirements to deploy OpenStack? Um, so you, you have a different set of needs that needs to be addressed. Um, and when you talk about connecting it all to the hardware, we, we have a, a, a full picture. Um, what next? So we identified three different areas uh, that we would like to focus on. So uh, as, as uh, Steve mentioned, the, the blueprint we have, right, the, the cloud solution that is validated is already available today, but we believe there's still things mi missing and there's work to be done in order to get us to that enterprise grade level that we want to give you as customer to have that state of mind, uh, quiet state of mind. And there's three topics are high availability, rolling upgrades, and deployment. And we'll start with high availability, uh, which is breaking into two, uh, which actually deals with both the tenants' high availability and the OpenStack services themselves' high availability and if active, active mode, et cetera. Uh, rolling upgrades, that's probably the number one uh, biggest headache we have today in OpenStack, right? It doesn't matter where did you jump on the OpenStack train, in what version, right? Uh, all the way to Kilo release, um, how do you upgrade, right? So I have, let's say I've jumped in uh, Juno and or Diablo, whatever. I want to upgrade now to the latest and greatest release. How does my upgrade going to look like, right? I have to stand the whole cloud environment again and migrate my, or, or, or would I be able to do it in a more CI level, continuous integration, etc. cetera. So, so that's a very problematic area that we are focused on. Um, with minimum downtime, of course. Deployment. Um, OpenStack deployments are very complex. Uh, and as you can imagine, they can be spread around the world in different locations, et cetera. But we would like to get to a point where we can automate the process to almost like an easy button uh, uh, deployment tool. Uh, and that's the goal, right? We're doing everything the, uh, automated. And what about deployment? That's something that is currently missing from OpenStack, and we're seeing as, as the next thing that we want to focus on. So we'll start with high availability uh, of services. And what high availability of services means is means if I shut down my compute node, Nova, I just kill it, everything is still working. My VMs that were hosted using that VM uh, 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 controller are actually being able to migrate automatically to that, and similar to what we have today in uh, traditional virtualization. But it also means that I need to, uh, my cloud implementation need to survive any port and failure. If I, uh, Steve mentioned that pulling cables out, right, that we're, we're doing as part of the validation of the cloud infrastructure. Your whole site can go down. It's not just one node, which this is why we have built in AJ, but the whole cloud implementation go down, go down and you need to be able to do disaster recovery. So when IAJ is the first step for disaster recovery. And, and today we have a lot of active active already uh, uh, built into OpenStack services, uh, but we still have some holes, as I'm going to mention in a second. And I'm going to give you some example how we utilize, for example, Pacemaker, uh, uh, as well as AJ Proxy and Horizon VIP. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen this slide before, but Today, that's pretty much what's happening under the covers when uh, I'm getting a service using my, uh, my Horizon UI dashboard. And guess what? One of my uh, 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 controllers goes down. So, so I have basically a controller pairs being in AJ mode where we leverage AJ proxy. And the way we do it, we actually leverage uh, a virtual IP as well for Horizon. So we basically are able to route uh, uh, all the traffic from uh, one set, one pacemaker cl uh, cluster to another. If we look at the high availability, uh, this is where we had gaps. Until uh, 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 the Juno release, uh, if I had a cloud uh, uh, a network agent going down, 
and that used to give service to specific uh, tenants, guess what? These tenants cannot get a service because the node was done. So we needed to fix that problem, and the fix was, came in a virtual uh, 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 router redundancy protocol, the VRRP. Uh, so it's already supported in RHEL OSP6, and it pretty much provides us the AJ network uh, uh, built in already per, per tenant, and we have a keep alive process uh, 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 per virtual route, so we are able to actually route uh, uh, the traffic upon failure. Um, that's pretty much how it looks. So we have uh, virtual master, uh, and then we have backups that on, on the other nodes, and when, ha when uh, one of the nodes goes down, it can be automatically served by another uh, backup virtual router. All right, so we talked about uh, the service high availability. Let's zoom into the tenant's high availability. And I would just give one example because uh, we have limited time. And we do, I do encourage you, there's a lot of sessions, other sessions that go in much more detail to deep dive in each one of this, but just to give you some highlight uh, uh, so you can feel where we are. So we started with Juno, so I talked about the VRP. That was a big milestone was added because that was a single point of failure. Um, in Kilo, which we just released, uh, uh, we're now focus, uh, uh, focusing on, on providing instance high availability using uh, Pacemaker. So if we have, we need to migrate our, our uh, VMs, if our whole hypervisor went down, we need a way to do it, and we're gonna leverage uh, pacemaker, and of course there's a whole fencing mechanism happening to detect the failure and to do the, uh, the trigger all the way up to Nova so we can actually perform the operation. Uh, moving to the Liberty release, some areas that we still need hardening is like migration. So I just mentioned a hypervisor going down, right? And the, the unit can grow all the way to, as I said, to a site failure. We need a way to make sure that automatic evacuations of my instances happen in all states, including non-active states. And believe it or not, we're, sti uh, we're still not there. So uh, uh, there's a way. For, there's a still way for us, a way for us to go to actually make sure that all the cases of VM migration are are, de are there. And and sadly, it's not. We have something like six blueprint just on hardening the uh, 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 the ability to live migrate instances. Um, if we look at Cinder, uh, Cinder is uh, until this release is pretty much the only core service that still doesn't work in active active. It's still active passive. And uh, uh, so that, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, in this release, I won't go into all the features that are uh, being uh, uh, addressed, but there's, uh, just to give you an example, if I have a volume, am I going to create a volume uh, using uh, the Cinder volume, and I'm going to shoot the Cinder node during the process, I would be stuck in that state. If I'm going to go and uh, uh, create a, a change of quota in Cinder, and I will shoot the Cinder volume, uh, node, boom, I'll be stuck in that state forever. So we, we still have a few states that are not there and dealt with, and the way to deal with it is, is actually task flows. Uh, so the, uh, there's work right now being done uh, on volume persistent support to actually mitigate it. So it will allow the operator to safely shut down the Cinder API and for maintenance, right? So we talked about different kind of fellows from different resources, but this is something that is useful for operational. I need to be able to do this just to maintenance, right? I need to do upgrades, et cetera, updates, etc. I need that to work. And this is something that we're working on so we can actually resume our work uh, after uh, um, in the block storage service. Moving on, uh, the third topic I mentioned is uh, uh, deployments and upgrades, the two and third, and I will start with deployment. And when we look at deployment, we typically figure, yeah, we need to install OpenStack, that, that's our goal. Guess what, that's our starting point. Now you need to manage your OpenStack environment. Um, and the focus is on is basically provide tools uh, that are identified by OpenStack operators in production to control and debug. So as an operator, I need a way to know, first of all, A, there was a failure in my site. One of the nodes went down. How do I know about it, right? Um, two, how do I debug the problems? What log aggreg aggregation, log search tool I have available out of the box to actually support me maintain my OpenStack? So we, again, just to zoom out, we are discussing enterprise-grade OpenStack. How many of you run production environment today, not even in cloud? 
If something goes down, you need to know where. And if we go back to the analogy, the analogy I gave with car, if I have any problem with my brakes, I will get an indicator on my dashboard. This is what I'm talking about. We need that indicators, we need that in dashboard indicators to help us know what's going on in our cloud environment. Uh, when we talk about other management tools, so I'm running an enterprise environment, I have different tools, and being uh, able to standardize OpenStack APIs to allow us to manage uh, and use other management tools as part of our deployment. That's key, right? Uh, we're not, we're not, OpenStack as a server is all about being a pluggable infrastructure. Management and deployment management needs to be part of that a open API. Um, I want to add or remove capacity, right? I need tools to allow me to do it on the fly without bringing out any service downtime and actually allow me to uh, uh, bring to life the elasticity promise that OpenStack brings, right? If I am not able to do it in a consistent way, an easy to do way, what am I doing? Uh, providing control API to external tools I mentioned, but the last thing is actually updates. And when I talk about updates, I'm not just talking about, uh, right, we have a software update for OpenStack, but also patch management, right? I, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very strong dependencies to the hypervisor, uh, OS, et cetera. I need to be able to run security patches. Let's say there's a, a severity one security uh, 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 bug that needs to be addressed. How do I roll that bu bug fix, which is critical in zero day, right, throughout my cloud? I need consistency tools to do that, to allow me to do it on a regular basis. So to capture the focus we're doing is, uh, on the develop development side is actually 360 uh, life cycle that includes both updates and upgrades as well as capacity adjustment. Um, and this is where I actually want to uh, give you some hint. Uh, in the next Rel OSP version uh, that's going to come up this summer, we're going to introduce uh, what we call the Rel OSP Director, which is a new deployment tool. It's based on um, O, which is uh, uh, the operator uh, 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 way to deploy and manage your uh, under cloud and upper cloud as well as inspired by other tool, which is more CI/CD tool, it's called Spinal Stack. And this is coming up in the next release. And it will allow you to deal not just with the de deployment, but also uh, bring a lot of management tools so you can manage better your cloud and what's, what's going on in my cloud, as well as uh, allow me a way to do updates, patches, management, et cetera, and of course, trying to hit the bigger problem, which is upgrades, and allow me to stay on a, 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 a consistent place where I am in OpenStack, let's say now Juno release, I want to be able to stay that for a year, get all my patches, and still re, uh, uh, have my production stability. But when I do want to upgrade to the next release, and by the way, the fact that OpenStack has a release every six months doesn't mean I need to move all my investment every six months, right? I, I still want to have the stability, get my uh, backported. Some of the features are being backported. Actually, we're doing it for customers per release when it's avail uh, uh, available. But it also allows us, when we do want to move to the Liberty release, right, do it in an easy way without taking out the whole investment and setting another cloud and migrating all of my instances to the, the second cloud. And with that, I want to actually uh, uh, summarize uh, uh, the solution and what we've done, just to zoom back to uh, the thing that Steve uh, actually was describing earlier and the work we're doing. Uh, so we, we are taking uh, OpenStack uh, as well as the hardware, and we're doing a lot of work just to integrate it too. Throughout the cycle, we found a lot of issues that, are, believe it or not, are not OpenStack issues. Uh, Steve mentioned the, uh, the pacemaker box, for example. Bonding and networking was another one. So it allows us to actually harden OpenStack and get it to be a more production ready. And uh, if you want to hear more, uh, just go ahead and scan the barcode. The reference architecture is there, uh, and it's very detailed. As Steve mentioned, there's it's not just one configuration, it's different configuration that allows you to grow, uh, and it, we have different network topology, different storage topologies. Everything is outlined in the reference architecture, and of course we're here, and, and now it's time pretty much to open uh, the uh, Q&A. All right, Steve, you wanna join me back? All right, uh, if you have any questions, please use the uh, mic uh, at the front here so everybody else can hear it. All right. Everybody's taking picture, yeah. which is good. No, they, they scan <laughs> the, the QR code, yeah. 
So any question, technical, any level, all right? It means you did a good job. <laughs> all right. <laughs> or, uh, uh, so thank you very much. And yeah, thank you. Yeah.